Is there a place for red-faced screaming? Find out next on 10 Tenets of Leadership. Welcome to this episode of 10 Tenets of Leadership. I'm Andy McCaskey from STR News, and today we're going to be talking about contention and conflict within the enterprise. Our host, as always, Larry Pendergrass. Thank you, Andy. Good morning. Good morning. I'd also like to welcome uh, Paul Ziegelbaum. Paul, would you uh, introduce yourself, please? Thank you, Larry. Um, I have uh, been a, uh, I'm an engineer by training and uh, have been an engineer and manager and executive in several industries in my career and recently retired as uh, CEO of a medical device startup, CA Meta Sensors. Great. Welcome, Paul. And we also have Steve Fossey here today. Steve. Good morning, Larry. Uh, currently, I'm at Symmetricom. I'm the director of new business development. Uh, in previous lives, uh, I spent uh, a lot of time at HP and Agilent over 27 years, uh, and uh, a lot of what I'll talk about today comes from my experiences at HP and Agilent. Thanks for joining us. We're going to uh, uh, have a discussion today about constructive contention in the workplace. And uh, this is one of the 10 tenets of leadership. Uh, just briefly, this, uh, this tenet describes the need to have an environment where people are free to put information out on the table, sort through it in a constructive way, allow for some contention. People naturally have disagreements in the workplace, allow for that, but do it with respect, do it constructively. So we'll talk today a little bit about people's experience in this area and contrast it perhaps with, with some of the things that we've uh, heard about in the news, et cetera. And I'd like to first turn, if I can, to Paul and ask Paul, what is your experience, pro or con, with this tenant? That's a great question, and I was thinking about that before we began, and I realized that I've been both a beneficiary of a good experience when that tenant has been practiced and a victim of the situation when it has not uh, in my career. And, uh, of course, that's how I learned what I learned about this tenant myself. Um, I, I would say that um, in, in a number of cases in my career, there have been times when I've had either a, a member of a team or even a leader of the team who practiced what I would call either intimidation or, um, or lack of respect for the rest of the team members and shut off contention, which meant that the leader never got access to the information that was really important. Uh, and then I've both been involved in teams and led teams that got to the point where they could in fact get all the elephants out on the table and discuss them openly and use facts rather than opinion to solve issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it sounds to me like you've had both experiences where it's been used and not used. Have you seen a situation where constructive contention actually turned out not to work in the workplace very well? Um, I would say the only time I've seen that happen is when the team itself that was trying to practice it had not built up mutual trust and respect to the point where the facts mattered to them. They weren't receptive to the facts. They were hung up in their opinions. Right. Yeah. Good point. There's a, a great uh, book, very small one that, that your readers, can, your uh, viewers could, could look at here, Andy, called uh, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Certainly one of the things that it's talked about in there is that need for mutual trust as a base for building a great uh, teamwork and be able to get to the point where you have something like this constructive contention. So uh, how about you, Steve? What kind of a experience have you had in the workplace with this tenant? Um, like Paul, I had uh, both good and bad experiences uh, with contention in the workplace. Um, I was uh, the, on the senior staff of a large division inside of HP uh, where we actually set it up to have uh, constructive contention and uh, it worked really well. And I think the reason it worked really well was we had uh, put some thought into it up front as to how to create uh, what we regarded as the right amount of uh, contention not too much and, and not too little. And uh, it worked very well. Uh, we had uh, the division divided into four business teams, but the resources were divided by skill set. So for example, there was a manager for <coughs> software engineers 
and then the software engineers were allocated out to the businesses based on projects. And there was a con there was a constructive tension uh, deliberately set up between the needs of the software engineers to get training and to do common methodologies uh, versus the needs of the businesses to uh, get things done. And that was all laid out ahead of time before we went to that model. And it worked really well. The software engineers felt like people were paying attention to their careers and their professional development. And at the same time, the business teams got the resources they needed to uh, you know, move ahead. Yeah, very good. So uh, in the spectrum of what we might imagine for contention, you can imagine no contention at all in the workplace on one end and destructive contention on the other end of the spectrum. So uh, Paul, you've just uh, started, you've opened this discussion a few minutes ago, but what really causes a no contention environment uh, or, and what, on the other extreme, what causes a destructive contention environment? And do you think sometimes people try to produce those? Ah, uh, very good question, Larry, uh, set of questions. Um, I, I think what creates no contention, in my experience, what I have seen, there are probably other ways to create that, but uh, the, the, the cases I've known about have been cases where the, uh, the leader of the team actually wanted to impose his own ideas, his or her own ideas, on the team and, uh, and had already preconceived all the solutions and, uh, and information that was necessary. And as things progressed on the project, was not interested in how things were changing uh, that might affect those answers. Uh, and so I, I watched that happen. Uh, I, I even watched a, a, um, a manager go around his room and basically state all of his objectives and how they're gonna be achieved and go around and ask everyone in the room their opinions and shoot down all the opinions. So by the third staff meeting, no one ventured opinions. You know, and, and nothing got done, by the way. So, so, so that, that was an extreme case. Um, uh, and you asked the question, I mean, do people intentionally do that? Well, I, you know, there are certainly some dysfunctional managers who try to, try to simply uh, prove that they're the smartest people in the room. That can also happen with individual members of teams. Uh, when it's a, a new team, there's not a lot of trust built up yet, or it's a team that has had a lot of dysfunctional history, uh, there can be individuals who try to simply impose what they want. Now, so uh, some people think that uh, uh, a, a, uh, an environment of even destructive contention uh, brings out the best in people. And so, Steve, what do you think about that? I think that, uh, you know, there, there are certain famous leaders that, that talk about producing this kind of environment. What, what do you think? Uh, not a big fan, Larry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, uh, I think most people uh, are willing to offer up their opinions, but um, they're not willing to get into it. A lot of people are not willing to get into a food fight over it. Uh, and um, in my time at, at HP and Agilent, uh, I was in some very intense meetings uh, with very uh, strongly expressed opinions, uh, but it was after everybody knew each other and the uh, respect and the trust was in place so that you could have these heated arguments and everybody understood uh, that you were doing it for the good of the business and not because you were just trying to you know, advance your own career or something like that. Um, so it, it has to be in the right environment. Um, otherwise, it's just, uh, you know, who can yell the loudest and beat their chest the hardest? And, and typically that's not the best solution. So a common theme I'm hearing here is that you really need to set that platform of trust. And then actually the constructive contention can get more contentious. Uh, yeah. it, people can tolerate it more because they know that the people they're working with have the same agenda that they do and they have some trust. That's yeah. Right. yeah, I think I think that's right. I, uh, I was um, uh, running a business for a semiconductor test for a while at Agilent and uh, I worked for, um, uh, my boss ran several of these divisions and we all knew each other. We had all known each other for years and uh, we got into this uh, discussion about uh, ranking and uh, the, the idea that was floated by my boss was um, maybe the bottom 5% of ranking should leave the company. And there were three guys who thought that wasn't a bad idea. And there were three guys who thought that was the dumbest idea we'd ever heard. And uh, we spent about 90 minutes uh, yelling at each other <laughs> over this. And, 
And uh, the amazing thing was we all walked out of the room still friends and, um, you know, still believing in each other and what we were trying to do uh, and having reached a decision. Uh, but we were only able to do that because we had all known each other for years and uh, we had the trust in place. So whether or not you perceive that you're disrespecting each other has a lot to do with whether that trust is already in place. Yeah. You can, for instance, yell at somebody who doesn't know you and there's the implication that there's some, di some disrespect there. Whereas yeah. if you have a strong relationship, it may be otherwise. Is that right? Well, uh, in general, yeah. I mean, uh, if, if you're yelling at somebody that you don't know and they don't know you, it's going to come across as bullying. I mean, yeah. there's no other yeah. way, right? Uh, right? But if you have the relationship in place uh, and they know, you know where you're coming from, uh, then you can, you can get a little more animated about the whole thing. So, Paul, where does yelling, in your opinion, fit in the workplace? <laughs> is, it, is it a part of constructive contention that people are pounding their fists on the table and really getting red-faced? Is this still constructive contention? You it's, know, it's, it's, a very, it's a very good question. I, I'm thinking about some uh, events I've witnessed and been part of uh, like that, and I, I would say um, – there are times when some individuals, even in a, an environment of trust, when trust has built up, uh, who will get so angry about a particular issue that they'll be pounding the table, they feel so strongly about it, or even get up and walk out of the room. I've seen that happen. Uh, and uh, what I noticed is if that happens in a team that has been through the change process of getting to the point where openness is the natural way, uh, and, and they're doing their contention based on fact, exchange and not just opinion exchange, um, it actually is not destructive. It, it's a little harmful in the sense that, uh, let's say a person gets up and leaves the room, it leaves the rest of the people feeling let down you know, by that person. Uh, but in the long run, what I've noticed is it actually strengthens the team because when the team gets back together, there's uh, more openness. And, and that's a very interesting result. It's almost counterintuitive. Uh, and I think I go along with Steve. It depends on how much trust has been built up. And that is a direct function of the leadership of that team. Uh, one of the things you said, Paul, that, uh, that I relate to is, um, is the idea that teamwork is actually developed through people working together on an issue for some period of time, maybe having several battles that they've won together. I, I've, I've always felt that teamwork was really developed by people slugging through a problem together as opposed to teamwork exercises. Is that the way oh, you see it? Oh, absolutely. The exercises are uh, like kindergarten in my mind. <laughs> the, the real teamwork comes from, and, and, and from working together to solve a difficult problem. And in fact, I've actually taken the, the, the position and, and uh, worked in situations where I've had team members who were not getting along assign them to accomplish something together and by the end of it if it's well led they they in fact learn to trust each other so. yeah yeah makes sense makes sense so so steve are there can you go too far with this whole idea of constructive contention are there right times or wrong times you mentioned that you you, you had a, a situation where you you consciously decided as a group what too much or too little was and targeted for that so tell me about that. What is too much or too little con uh, a contention? Well, uh, what we were trying for was a, a state that I think is hard to define, that uh, you, you would get better answers, more creative answers, than if you just uh, accepted you know, someone's decision at face value. And uh, that was sort of consciously put into the, uh, the system. It was a formal matrix organization. And that was consciously put into the matrix structure uh, before we rolled it out to the team. And um, you know, we, we actually thought about that and said, OK, how do we get people to get creative and, and think a bit outside their comfort zone, but at the same time not just get uh, so freaked out that they lock up and don't offer any, any kind of solution? And uh, you know, we took our best shot at it. And then we, um, we tweaked things along the way where we thought, OK, maybe this part of the matrix has a little too much uh, power. Or maybe this other part doesn't have enough. And, and we tweaked things along the way. And it took us um, from the time we rolled it out until the time everybody generally acknowledged that it was going smoothly. Um, it took about two years. But um, you know, it, it worked pretty well from the get-go. But uh, until we all felt, yeah, this is, this is going OK, it was about two years. 
So I'm wondering if there are then uh, right and wrong times to argue. I mean, uh, some people say that you should never disagree with your boss in public, for instance. So <laughs> let's take this constructive contention then to, uh, you know, when is it appropriate, even in an environment where a culture where constructive contention is appreciated? Paul, what do you think? Well, there, there are definitely, I, I wouldn't call it necessarily right and wrong times. There are better and worse times, uh, in my view. Uh, for example, um, attempts at constructive uh, conflict um, when the team isn't ready for that probably are not going to work. Um, uh, and and so I, I view it as a process of getting the team to the point where they're ready to do that in small stages. It happens in steps. And uh, I, I pick up on what something Steve said. He said there's a hard to define process in there uh, or state. And uh, I know because I've been I've led teams through this several times in my career of dysfunctional teams that I took over. Um, I, I know that I can predict how long it'll take me to get them to where they can be fully open with each other. Uh, and, and I can recognize those stages, but I'd be hard pressed to figure out how to express what those points are, except that you see it in unspoken bo uh, language, body language. You see it in the way people listen to each other, uh, you know, the listening skills that are applied and the, and, the, and the respect that's shown. And as that develops, you can allow for and even encourage and, in, I would say, as a leader, incite constructive criticism in, uh, or constructive conflict among the team members um, but you, you need to be careful how you do that and uh, and and so I, I, if it's initiated by the team themselves I think as a leader you have to watch that process and protect the weaker members of the team mm -hmm. that's a good part of change management and your change management thoughts yeah. it sounds like yeah that's good so so Steve if you're uh, Steve if you're in um, in a large group meeting the CEO is up there speaking and and you disagree with one of those points, are you going to stand up and, uh, and point it out there? Or is that, uh, is that part of constructive contention? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when That's I was a in... career limiting move, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it's just not the right spot. You, you can certainly disagree with it, but uh, it doesn't do uh, you or the CEO or the team any good for you to stand up in a large group and say, hey, that's, that's a load of crap. Uh, you know, you may think that, but you can tell him or her that later on. Uh, when I was in the um, matrix organization that I uh, was referring to, uh, we actually developed a decision-making model. And that sounds really fancy, but it was actually four or five bullet points on a slide. And we actually made it into a little uh, poster that we hung up in the room where we held our staff meetings so that when other people in the division uh, would use that room for meetings, they would see, here's how we make decisions. And, uh, you know, we didn't try and keep it secret. We told everybody about it. We kept that poster up in the room the whole time. And basically it was a model of, hey, uh, you know, the boss can propose an answer. Uh, we have a debate. Um, it's okay to take timeouts during the debate if we feel we're getting off topic or off process. And then uh, if we reach a consensus, we go with that. If we don't, uh, the boss has the right to make the final choice so that we don't get hung up. And then uh, we walk out of the room and we all support that decision. But uh, you know what's um, implicit in that is that the disagreements are in the staff meeting. They're not out when you're out in front of the team. Great, yeah. I think that's really, really good, a good practice. You, of course, if you have something like that in your company and you move to a different company, I found that you actually do have to be pretty careful to try to learn quickly what their decision methods are. <laughs> yeah. So I've been in a situation <laughs> where I expected this constructive contention behind closed doors, and then everybody would come to a conclusion. You go out and support it as a staff. Uh, and yet I found myself headlong in uh, where I thought I was still in the constructive contention phase, but the boss had already make, made a decision and wasn't so clear about communicating it. <laughs> so you do yeah. certainly have to be careful. And, and, and I, I, I was going to say, I'm sorry, uh, Steve, uh, just, uh, just a thought. Uh, what, one, of the, one of the symptoms I noticed that it's not to the point where it's working is, uh, of course, that you go through a process as Steve proposed and or, or described, and then you find out that some either destructive or constructive conflict is happening outside the team process, yes. yeah. you know you've yeah. got a problem. <laughs> yeah. right. And that's, yeah. that's, that's what I was going to say was, uh, you, you know, you, you were describing, Larry, the, uh, the process where uh, the boss has made up his mind, he just hasn't told anybody. Right. Uh, 
I've, <laughs> I've witnessed uh, the reverse where uh, the boss has made up his mind, he's announced it, but uh, one or more members of his staff has done a pocket veto on it and mm -hmm. isn't out there supporting it because right. he didn't agree with it. You know? Right. And that's, uh, <laughs> as, as you know, that's just fantastically destructive. And, Absolutely. And that's, that's why you have to be able to debate those things openly uh, at the staff level so that when you do walk out of the room with the decision, everybody backs it up. Tremendous, yeah. So, you know, as, as kind of a, a final thought here, I'm wondering if you, if, if you, how, what are the things that you would tell other people who are interested in creating, moving from, say, a destructive or a no contention environment toward this constructive contention? How do you create this kind of environment? Why don't we start with Paul? And I, I look back to how I've done this, and the first thing you have to do as a leader is actually demonstrate openly, actively, that, that you as a leader are open to uh, having your position criticized, right? And, and to new information or to things you didn't notice. Uh, uh, and, and I think that beyond that, then you have to uh, show that you respect that information. You also have to set an example of not just taking a person's opinion as, as key information, but asking that person, okay, here's, that's the opinion you've stated. Now, what in your experience brings you to that, that, that opinion? And then you start to get to the facts behind that person's thinking, and that's what's really key. Yeah, good point. Yeah, Steve, how about your experiences here? Uh, well, uh, I guess my, my advice would be, first of all, um, people, a lot of people think that, you know, we're going to redraw the org chart and we're done. And uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, the difficult fact to accept is that, uh, you know, you can redraw an org chart in a day. And, and uh, if you really want the changes to uh, stick, you're going to spend the next year to two years uh, implementing the implications of what you just redrew on the org chart in a day. And um, so, so that would be my one piece of advice is don't think you're done the day you redraw the org chart. In fact, you're just getting started. The, the other piece of advice I would offer is something that Paul touched on is you can actually um, learn uh, methods and languages that encourage constructive contention. Uh, as Paul alluded to, um, people saying, here's what I believe. Here's the evidence for why I believe that, but I'm open to someone else offering evidence that, that seems to disagree with that. So you can actually learn um, a language that the teams can speak to each other that will uh, prevent them from getting defensive and digging in and encourage sort of an open inquiry into the problem you're trying to solve. And that would be my other piece of advice is take the time to, to learn some of those techniques uh, because they really do help. Great, thank you. Actually, we've talked about uh, constructive contention, and we've also talked about change management quite a bit in this session. Maybe we'll be back at a later time talking about 10 tenets of change management. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to thank you both, Paul and Steve, for joining me uh, on this uh, episode, and uh, uh, appreciate your wisdom, and uh, thanks a lot for uh, coming to SDR News. Thanks for inviting me. Happy to be here, thank you. Thanks to both of you for joining us here today. Really great session. I've been taking a lot of notes and I uh, found out that maybe there is a place for a little bit of red-faced screaming as long as you're able to deliver that respectfully. Thanks to you folks for joining us as well. We'll see you next time on 10 Tenets of Leadership.